Thank you all for turning out on the night. I, it, those of you in the back, can you hear me? Okay, as long as if I start fading, you know, start waving your arms and, and go into your ears so that we make sure that you can hear me. I prefer, as I told some of the folks who were here a little bit earlier, I prefer to not use the mic primarily because I talk with my hands sometimes and I get to waving and you can't very well hear people with the mic when the mic's out here and the mouth is back here. Uh, I will try to get to as many of the questions as we can. Uh, it probably won't be as much fun as the basketball game going on next door. We will try to stick close to the hour, but it, we won't have a buzzer that goes off mid-question uh, on the hour, and I may go over a little bit longer. It's just that I find that I start getting tired uh, when I've been on my feet for a long period of time. So I'll try to get to as many questions as I can. Um, I really do appreciate everybody turning out tonight. If anybody has, uh, as you all know, I have uh, three children, all under the age of 11, 11 and under. Uh, so if anybody has, you know, children they need to get back for or they've got other duties that, that are required that they need to make sure that they take care of, do not think that you are going to offend me if at some point during the evening you have to get up and, and go take care of your uh, family duties. That's just a part of the way it works, and so if you have to leave, I understand that. That being said, uh, let's start on this side of the room. What I usually like to do is I'll do a wave, and then I'll come back. We'll try to get to every question that we can. Who wants to ask the first question over here? Yes, ma'am. I have to read a little bit of it. Sure. I want to ask you a little bit about um, the um, super committee and defense cuts. Um, I was just reading this report. It's called the U.S. Economic Impact of Approved and Projected Department of Defense Spending Reductions. And it's by Stephen uh, Fuller. And he's um, on the board of uh, economists for uh, Governor McDonald in Virginia. And he said that the impact of just one part of the defense cuts, um, and that's the purchase of military equipment, would cost Virginia nearly 123,000 jobs. And, um, you know, one of the, the um, issues has been um, if the uh, super committee did not come up with a plan that cuts were going to have to occur in all of the areas, domestic and uh, defense. And, and I don't mean that they're the only ones, but, you know, domestic spending and spending on defense. Yes, ma'am. And so I, I know that most of that, you know, right now Virginia is at something like 6.4% unemployment, unemployment. Yes, and never above 7.2 or 4 or something like that. It's, so one of the reasons is in that crescent between D.C. and Tidewater and Richmond area, so many people work uh, for firms that are doing that kind of work for the Department of Defense. So, given that you are for spending cuts, what is that going to do if, if we decide to do, you know, government spending cuts because that is there's government. A couple of, there's a couple of different questions but, in there. Uh, let me repeat the general question, and that was, uh, with the Super Committee not being able to reach an agreement, there, is suppo there are supposed to be automatic cuts in both the domestic and the military spending. Cuts to the military spending would disproportionately hurt Virginia because so much in the crescent of the job base is based on the defense industry. And since I am in favor of defense cuts, you know, how do I feel about that and where do I think we go? Let me say Washington loves to do brinksmanship, uh, diplomacy, and governance. I don't like it but I'm not in a position yet to make major changes on that. Those cuts that are automatic cuts, they call it sequestration, but automatic cuts is a better description, don't kick in until 2013. So just because the super committee failed doesn't mean that we don't have time to rectify it. That being said, we have to make cuts. We're $15 trillion in debt. This year alone, we spent one point, this, excuse me, this past fiscal year, we spent $1.5 trillion that we didn't have. So the problem is getting worse. Earlier today, I spoke to uh, middle school students and advised them that they had 40, it was amazing, they asked the economic question and then I told them, 
You're now in debt $48,000, man, every man, woman, and child. That means you. I'm 53. I won't be here to pay all that debt back. You will be. It will affect you more than it will affect me, but we've got to try to change it. Now, will there be impacts? Yes, and I think we should try to make those impacts as minimal as possible. There are a lot of things that we can do to create jobs besides uh, or to make up for those cuts. That being said, it's not going to be easy. The super committee failed, uh, I think, in part because we have a divided philosophy of government. And that's, that's a part of the system designed uh, by our forefathers. Can't hear me. Do I need to use the mic? All right, I'll try using the mic. Is that better for everybody? Yes. Okay. I, I prefer not to, but if we need it, we'll use it. Uh, where was I? Uh, we'll, try to, we'll try to make sure that we make these cuts as minimal as possible. Uh, I don't want to see major damage done to the Defense Department. That being said, there are things that have to happen. I've already voted and it didn't pass to bring 10,000 troops home from Europe. $800 million a year. We have 40,000 troops stationed in Europe. To me, it doesn't make sense. While the Russians are always going to be uh, a country to keep an eye on, the Soviet threat is no longer there. Why do we still have 40,000 troops in Europe and at the cost that we have? We have to take a look at that and we have to make decisions. One of the biggest things that I've discovered is, is that we have something called mandatory spending. How many of you all have heard that term on TV? Well, they weren't able to cut the mandatory spending. Well, what makes it mandatory? That was one of my questions, because I got in there and found that the agriculture bill was more than 80%, excuse me, the agriculture appropriations that we voted on in the spring was more than 80% mandatory spending. I'm like, wait a minute, I just got elected. You mean all those folks who came in front of me set the spending requirements and I, I can't change, but about 13 or 14% of it? Now, that's right. That was the answer. That didn't make sense to me, so I'm going to try to find an answer because it's not in the Constitution. And it's in a rule of the, of the House. So I'm starting to make some waves behind the scenes. I think the rules ought to be changed. I think we ought to be able to look at every budget item. Now, most folks think of mandatory spending. They immediately think of Social Security and Medicare. And look, nobody is trying to dismantle those programs. Don't believe some of the things you hear about that. You know, we're not dismantling Social Security and Medicare. We may change some of the rules for Social Security. I may have to be a little bit older before I'm entitled to, to draw it. Others may have to be a little bit older than me. We've got to change some of the rules so it'll be fiscally sound long term, but that can be done. But we are talking about a lot of programs that you wouldn't believe. Some of you probably read the article in the run of times where I said, and I stand by it, I don't think we should spend $69.3 million for a retirement home for horses. It does mean, however, I mean, you know, it does mean that we would have to find a way to humanely euthanize, I told the middle school kids, that means kill the horses. It's not necessarily pleasant, but our government doesn't have the money to spend that kind of money on those kinds of programs, and that's just one of thousands of programs that I think we should take a look at. But because the law was passed in 1971, the way the rules are set up, I don't get a vote to cut that. I said, let's amend that. Find out how much it would cost to, to do the humane. We're not talking about, you know, starving horses or anything, but a humane euthanization program. Oh, you can't do that. It's mandatory spending. Very frustrating when, you know, more than half of almost all of what they're spending is mandatory, and you get areas like, uh, like the program with, with the horses where you can't even get to it. 80% on ag. So I voted against the ag bill. Of course, I'm sure that at some point somebody will say, you know, Griffith isn't in favor of farmers. Well, it's not true. I just think that we have to be careful with how we spend every dollar that we spend. And right now, the automatic cuts look heavily at military. We don't change the way Washington works. It's just automatic. Um, I don't really like that approach. I hope that we can find something before we get to fiscal year 2013. But we've got about a year that we can work on those programs and find something different. Uh, and in all fairness, when you hear the numbers that have to be cut, it sounds really big. But remember, they're always talking about 10-year numbers. So divide that number by 10. It can be done. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be comfortable. But it can be done.
So we do have to watch out for Virginia too, but what we can't say we're going to make Virginia whole and not cut anything and be fair about it. Well, I'm Get, more concerned about our area because we have much higher unemployment than even those absolutely. areas. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, There's some other things we're getting. I'm going to go back here and then I will, I'll, I'll make sure I get to you. Yes. Yeah, I have a couple of statements, Mr. Griffin. Yes, sir. A question. First of all, what you have to realize, Congress is the reason Social Security is in the shape it's in. They mandated to take money out of that yeah. starting in 1948. They actually stole the money from Social Security programs. So, you know, you have to realize that. If you want to change, make Congress put it back. All right. Secondly, a lot of the people in Montgomery County is probably not aware of what we call Agenda 21, sustainable living. Your county leaders have signed on to this. It's a very socialistic program. For instance, if your neighbor doesn't like your house, he can contact HUD under this. They will come in and tear your house down, build a duplex so they can move someone with less uh, money to be equal with you. They do not want any uh, citizens to be any different. There's a lot of other things. The farms would give HUD the right to come in to tell you the fact that you have to raise cattle. You no longer can raise cattle. The crops you raise will go into a central store that the government will build and stuff. If you do not understand or believe me, please look up Agenda 21. This was accepted by the United Nations in 1989. What? Yeah, we are going to, and, and I don't mean to be rude, but because we have limited time, and lots of folks have questions. The question, you the can, question is, you can get to the question. I'd is there any answer. possible way Thank you me. can stop the funding coming in to this? There are five counties involved in this, which is a million and a half dollar grant from the federal government, six hundred and sixty-one thousand dollars. It's five counties in Virginia. There are four counties nationally. Well, under this particular group, they have a super planning commission. They've hired. Okay. Mr. Kevin Burton has been paid $270,000 a year to do a study. He's been working for two years. And the fact is, I feel like it's money thrown away, being socialistic as yes. it is. Let me, let me try to answer the question for you. To, to see if you sure. can stop the funding. In the, in the recent minibus, we slowed the funding down. I'd like to be able to tell you it was completely stopped. It was not. I do have concerns. I don't know that they go as far as, as you think they do, but that's, that is a debatable issue. But I do have concerns because it does give the federal government a lot of zoning authority. Uh, while I, we may disagree on, on how far the, the federal government would let it go, uh, there is some concern there. That being said, the money was taken out in part this gets a little complicated, so I'll explain it to you from the, the minibus, which is the budget bill that we just passed. We zeroed out the funding. However, language remained in the minibus that dealt with uh, allowing, and I believe it was Secretary of Interior, but it allowed uh, one of the agencies to take funds from another source and put into what, you're, what is known generally as Agenda 21. So we zeroed out the line item but the secretary still has some authority to shift funds around, but they would, they would have to cut some other program in order to do it. Uh, would rather have had it both zeroed out and had language uh, because it, it is a controversial program. Would have preferred to have seen it completely done away with. We'll have to see what the secretary does, but at least as far as a direct appropriation, it's gone. And uh, stay tuned. We'll, I'm keeping an eye on it and do my best. This is over a three-year period, this program is the grants that have already been allowed, I, I don't have any control over. But yeah. money going forward, we have, we have put, like I said, the budget bill zeroed out the line item, the minibus budget. And I didn't vote for it, but that's another story. But the, uh, uh, the secretary over that program could shift money from another program, but they would have to find the cuts to make it work. Okay. And, and the state of Virginia has also appropriated $661,000 grant for that. All right. 
Yes, ma'am, and then we'll swing over here. Yes, ma'am. And I promise you guys, I, we won't let the hour run out before y'all get a chance over on this side of the room. Yes, ma'am. If you could, and, and if you could be brief in any statements, because obviously lots of folks have questions. But go ahead. There's been a lot of activity in Congress, some of which you've been a part of, to abolish regulatory authority of the Environmental Protection Agency, the regulations to protect our earth. Study again because I think it's very important. 
Uh, I think that by losing jobs, we're hurting the economy, and we're actually damaging the environment at the same time, particularly the airborne pollutants. Uh, I know we're not going to agree, but that's, that's my position. You asked me about it, so I'll, I'll let you know. And I appreciate you being here this evening because I need to know that folks have differences of opinions. We don't expect the nation uh, to, to be uniform and everybody to be in agreement. And so thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> There's very likely to be cuts in Medicaid funding, I believe. And um, Congress, meanwhile, the members of Congress receive beautiful, free, first-class me medical funding for their own health. Would you be willing to set an example by cutting your own health care funding? All right. Let me, let me make it clear first. If, if yeah. There's a big problem out there on the Internet. Everybody believes that, that we get some kind of super-duper health plan. It's not a bad plan. It's the same plan that every other federal employee has. I don't have anything different than the other federal employees. Furthermore, just so since we're on that subject, not related to your question, folks think that, you know, you serve one term in Congress. How many of you have gotten that email? By golly, if they serve one term in Congress, they get a lifetime retirement. Y'all seen that email? Yeah. Not true. I get vested after, I think, five years. I, you know, I, it's all based, like, you know, it's based on that salary, which I have a bill in to cut the salary by 10%. It's not going anywhere. I don't want to mislead you. I wish it would go somewhere, but I'm never going to see that bill on the floor. There are too many other members that don't want to cut their pay by 10%. Uh, the bill was previously, a bill similar to that was previously put in by Gabrielle Giffords at a 5% cut. I don't see why in these times of economic stress we can't take 10%. The salary is $174,000, public record. I think we can take a 10% cut. Uh, on the health care, since I'm getting the same plan that the federal, all the other federal employees get, um, I doubt that it'll be cut. I'm not sure I would even favor that. I'd rather cut my salary than to cut the health care benefit. Not because it's such a great benefit, but to do it, you'd have to cut every federal employee, and I don't know that it's necessarily fair, because not all of them make the $174,000. But you could do it voluntarily for yourself. Um, I, I could do it voluntarily for myself. Uh, I'm not going to do it voluntarily for my children. But, you know, but I don't mind cutting my salary, and I do think we've cut our, I will tell you, we've cut our expense money um, already by 5%. We're looking at a total of 11% by the time we finish this first term, and we're hoping to return some of that money back. Uh, that, that is allotted for us to run our office and so forth. We're trying to be very frugal. Thank so, you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have two issues. You mentioned Social Security. Social Security is a self-sustaining program by a, financed by a payroll tax here, can and you, according to the Congressional yeah. Budget Office to solve... If you want to come over here, some of the folks say they can't hear you. I'll give you the mic. <laughs> <laughs> and do try to limit the, the statements to get okay. to the question so we can get to okay. as many people. Okay. Sure. You mentioned Social Security. Social Security is a self-sustaining program financed by a payroll tax and according to the Congressional Budget Office is solvent until 2037 or thereabouts. There is a very easy solution and a sensible solution to help Social Security and that is increase the limit on income tax. Not taxing income over $107,000 is just another tax protection for those earning a sustainable income. Why can't we just increase the, the, the tax, uh, payroll tax? Mm -hmm. And secondly, I have another issue, and this is an environmental issue. Um, we, we are facing a catastrophe in Virginia if the uranium banning mine is lifted. And I would like to know if you consider uranium mining safe. Thank you. I appreciate this evening. Oh, thank you. Let me talk about uranium first, and then we'll go back to Social Security. The first, your second question was on uranium mining. I don't know. Uh, the General Assembly is doing a study. I voted against a previous study because I didn't think that it would, when I was in the General Assembly, I voted against a previous study because I didn't think it was set up with the right parameters, the one they, that they wanted. I didn't think it had the right uh, components to it to give me an honest assessment of what I thought, so I voted against the study. You know, the problem with uranium mining is a little different than some of the others. While we may have problems with all mining, and some folks do, uranium mining, it, on most of the other, if you make a mistake, you can do a lot of rectification fairly quickly. On uranium mining, you make a mistake, you may be damaging your area for 100 years, 200 thousand. years, or 1,000 years, exactly. So I think we have to be very cautious, but I don't know the answer. The study, I don't think, has yet been concluded. They did, after I left, they went ahead and approved the study. Uh, I don't think it had anything to do with me leaving. 
but they were working <laughs> in that direction. They approved the study. That study, I think, is just about finished. Uh, I'll be interested to see what it says. I probably won't study it as carefully as I would have if I were still sitting in the State House, because that's a decision that the Virginia legislature will make. Uh, but I can't answer whether I think it's safe or not, because I haven't. What I really want to do is, when I'm still in the State House, is actually go to some of the sites and see what they were doing and what protections they they had put in place and so forth. Uh, so I don't know that I can answer that question in all fairness. On Social Security, here's the dilemma we have with, with the question. The question was, for those to just to remind you, why can't we just tax everybody all the way up instead of having a cap on the income that you make? And it gets into what you believe Social Security is. Now, Congress has not done it right. Any question about that? For I think the gentleman said since 1948, I haven't researched it, but that makes some sense for a long time. Originally, it was supposed to be you pay in a certain amount and you can expect to draw out. So a lot of constituents will say to me, this is not an entitlement program, Morgan. We paid into it. We're supposed to be able to draw out. The reason that there's a cap on the income is, is that there's a cap on how much you can draw out. Now, philosophically, if we want to, to say, and, and I think you can make the argument for it, okay, that may have been the way it was set up. That's not the way it is. Then I think you can take a look at that. There are two fixes that would guarantee Social Security solvency for quite some time into the future. That's one of them. The other one is to raise the age of retirement over a period of years. I favor that one. I would look at the one that you've proposed uh, and, and take a serious look at it because the realities on the ground are not the same as the philosophy that was originally passed back in the 1930s. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know how I would end up voting. It would depend on the nature of the bill and it would depend on whether or not we were, we were making a, a legitimate change in what we were doing with Social Security on the pay in, pay out formula. But I definitely think we can raise that age. Social Security, when it was founded, the average life expectancy was somewhere in the neighborhood of about 71. Today, for women, it's closing in on 80. Uh, and for men, it's a little bit less. Uh, and so to, to raise the retirement age by five years over a period of time, for people who are not near, look, don't want to scare anybody. If you're 54, if you're 59 or 64, we're not changing those rules. But if you're, there have been different proposals, 55 to and under or 50 and under, if you do a slow raising of the age, I think that makes sense. Because we all want to have a sound and secure program. Um, I hope to make it to 2037. We'll see. Stay tuned. But I would like for there to be a social security system there. And if we're not going to do it, I had a... Policeman asked me earlier today, he said, Are you going to let me opt out? He said, I want to know if I can opt out of Social Security because I think I can do better with that money than what the federal government has been doing. So these are issues we have to tackle. But those are two solutions that I think one I, I completely favor, the other one I would take a very hard look at is we had a comprehensive plan. One of the problems is I don't want to give Congress more money to borrow from Social Security. So if we looked at doing something different, I would want to make sure that we had lock boxes and handcuffs and everything else. That keep. But you, you know, folks, if you put cash on the table and you put a group of politicians in the room, I don't care how good they are, and the cash is laying there, there's going to be a dash for the cash. So you've got to make sure that you protect that money from politicians as a group from getting their hands on it or else they'll spend it on something else. And then we'll be back here, or somebody will be back here 20 years from now having the same conversation. Okay? Let me slide this way. I, I will try to get back to your question. But let me slide this way because these folks over here are feeling cheated. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dylan Hallbringer from Blacksburg. And my first presidential vote was for President Eisenhower. God bless him. And I would like to know about your thoughts about raising the income tax level at least back to what it was under President Eisenhower. To whom much is, to whom much, many people have, much is expected. To whom much is given, much is expected. And I really feel that we don't have a fair enough at this point um, tax structure for our very, very, very wealthy. I don't think they need another trust fund. I'm a financial advisor. It's not that I don't like money, and I like for my people to make it. But, you know, how many trust funds do we need? And I really believe President Eisenhower really cared about our nation, and I'd like to just go back there. wonder what you think. I, I would not favor that, and let me explain why. President Eisenhower served in a different time, in a different place, in many, many ways. Today, 
they could have even, I mean, maybe some of their science fiction writers could have imagined the internet and a couple of click of, of the mouse can move capital. In Eisenhower's time, A, the world had just come out of the, the, the world war. We were number one nation economically with no rivals. We're number one nation today, but now we have rivals. Not economically, not after World War, not during the Eisenhower administration. England might have been coming along, but we had no major rivals economically. You would agree with that, would you not? Yeah. Today we have major rivals. We have China that has moved from, in about 12 years, has moved from about, I don't know, fifth or sixth all the way up to number two. Uh, economically, they passed Japan about a year ago. Uh, we have India that's on, on the way up economically. We have Brazil that's doing all kinds of amazing things. We have countries that have more population and have a lot of resources. So what we have to be careful of is we don't chase our resources out of this country. I had a fellow come up to me. I was at a meeting. It wasn't my meeting. It was just a meeting I was at. He came up to me. He said, I've always invested in coal. And he says, that's how I've made my money. I've invested in coal stocks. I've never been a coal operator, but I've invested in coal stocks. He said, I've always invested in the United States until this year. This was 2011. He said, I've now invested, and I may have it slightly wrong, but he says, I've now invested my money. I did it on the Internet this week in a, in a mine in Mozambique that's going to be run by some South Africans and is being managed by the Brazilians and the Australians. Money from Southwest Virginia went to Mozambique, managed by Australians and Brazilians with supervisors from South Africa. This is what happens. And if you create a corporate tax structure or an income tax structure that makes it better to be somewhere else, that money will go there. That didn't happen in Eisenhower's day. Didn't happen. But Couldn't happen. US citizens. No, he's not changing his U.S. citizenship. He's investing his money elsewhere. But what happens is, is that, is that it changes some of the rules. And you know, I don't know what he's doing with his with his offshore banks. But all this stuff can be done with the click of the mouse. And and so the bottom line is, is that we have to be careful that we don't raise our tax rates to a point where we chase our capital and our investment overseas. So I don't think that it's it's you know some of these folks aren't following. I don't think. But but the bottom line is, I don't believe that we should. Have we right now? I believe the number one corporate tax in the world. Everybody else is low. I know, but it's corporate income tax. Same thing applies if you if you start hitting the people who own the corporations in a big way. That cash will flee, in my opinion. We disagree. They're still residents and citizens yeah. of this nation, so we should be able to tax them. Yeah. Well. Yeah. 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 Follow-up. You want to make a follow-up? I was just saying, we understand your argument. It just doesn't make any sense. Okay. Well, I don't understand, and this is where we just have to disagree, I don't understand not following that if the capital moves, that means the jobs moved with it. And if you move the jobs, you move the wealth, and you can't keep taxing people to a point where they, they take their capital and put it into jobs in another country and expect the United States to remain on the Yes, ma'am. Congressman Griffith for taking my um, question. I have sent a lot of information to your I have sent a lot of information to your office to um, um, Kelly Lundgren and Michelle Jenkins. Uh, I used to be on the other side of the sustainable development fence. Uh, I do believe, as most people do, that it's a great idea to be a good steward of your natural resources and take care of them. However, as it relates to the New River Valley Livability Initiative. I'm part of a team of researchers that's been looking into this for months and months. And it pains me to see people roll their eyes and giggle when the subject of the United Nations is mentioned because um, this uh, comes right from the Federal Register. Uh, we have found this. It's on the United States Federal Register. The Sustainable Development Challenge Grant Program, like we have here with the HUD grant, is a step in implementing Agenda 21, the Global Plan of Action on Sustainable Development, agreed to by the United States at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. So if there is a very um, intact agenda that goes along with this livability initiative, and we've been studying it in depth, and some of the things that, that we are particularly troubled by, 
One is no matter which side of this bench you think you sit on, don't we all uh, agree that we need to have the right information to make good decisions? And as a matter of fact, in Pulaski County, I have property there, the Pulaski County Board of Supervisors got a one-page executive summary from the Planning District Commission that got this grant. This is a partnership grant with HUD, the EPA, and the Department of Transportation. And one of the things that it says in this lengthy 68-page um, uh, grant description is that what this planning district is going to be charged with, on page 28 you'll find this, is in revising statutes and laws and charters so that, um, so that essentially we're going to reinvent government so our local representatives, we're not going to have a representative form of government. We will be answering to HUD, the Department of Transportation, and the EPA. This is, this is a part of that grant description which we have agreed to. So, question. My question, yes. my question is, in the Bergs, um, Chairman Sheffy with the Pulaski County Board of Supervisors has quoted you as saying in the Bergs that you see no federal control <coughs> as part of this grant program when there are 40 pages of mandates of must and shalls in this program. Let me repeat what she said. Uh, and and I, I don't know that I've seen it, but I understand that, that Chairman Sheffy and Pulaski sent something out saying, attributing certain comments to me. In reality, those were comments of uh, the agency. I asked them to send information to, to, directly to uh, Chairman Sheffy. They addressed it to me, but I never saw the letter or approved the letter before it went to Chairman Sheffy. So those are not my words or my comments. But the letter was sent to it was it was a, it said it was sent to me, but, but it was sent to Chairman Sheffy. But they're not my comments; they're the comments of the agency. They were presented as your. I point. understand that that was the case, but that is not accurate. Okay. Another question. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Um, relation uh, the question related to Medicare and Social Security. Come up and use the mic. Yeah, that's right. You should scrape that. Uh, thank you. Uh, since you said. Um, well, one third of our budget, federal budgets, to Medicare and the Social Security <coughs> system. The uh, and you did uh, indicate your uh, in terms of Social Security. Uh, in 2010, we spent 32 billion dollars more than we took in. Uh, that was a record. And uh, so you indicated that you're in favor of not borrowing any more money to cover that, which I would. Your proposal was, uh, the thought was to be, if I get you right, to change your program, which would be to increase the age limit. That is correct. Correct. Uh, reduce benefits, no. Reduce benefits, no. And to raise payroll taxes? Uh, I haven't made a final decision on that, but if we had a comprehensive, I guess I better take the mic back. <laughs> His question was, would I favor you know, raising the payroll uh, taxes? The answer would, would would be that I would have to study a comprehensive plan to save the program. I cannot tell you that I would vote against it, but I would have to see a plan that made sure that Congress wasn't going to just raid the money, because in reality, that's what's happened over the years is the Congress is taking that money, they put IOUs in the till, and, uh, and, and I don't think that's right. Particularly if you, and this is where it's difficult, if you buy into the you paid in, you take out, which, which goes counter to the philosophy of raising it above uh, for the higher income earners. But if that's what it took to get a comprehensive plan, I'd have to take a look at it and make sure that I thought it protected the money. It's not something that I myself am advocating. But look, I'm trying to you know, look at ways we can solve problems. And I know, just like I have to tell my kids, you don't get everything you want. I'm not going to get everything I want. And in a comprehensive reform package, I would take a look at it. The second. The, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. I agree with that. The second part is uh, the Social Security Disability Trust right. Disability, not the not the pension, not the retirement, side, right? Not the retirement side. It's projected to be exhausted by 2017. There is a. Do you support or oppose uh, the Social Security uh, uh, Commissioner? I guess it's Michael uh, Astrew uh, to change the formula that funds the DI program, the disability program, to divert funds 
based on the retirement income fund to the disability fund? Disability is a real, is a real issue that's, that's hard to solve a problem. And we've got lots of problems. Somebody who's truly disabled needs that money in order to be able to live. There's no question about it. We have a lot of people who are marginal. We have a lot of people who are disabled at one point, and some of them never get fully recovered, but some of them do. Or not fully recovered, but they get back to where they could work. Social Security has a mindset. The disability side has a mindset right now that once you're on, you should stay on. I have a friend who was disabled at one point in time. He's now working. He's been working for several years. He is still receiving letters from the Social Security disability side, SSI side, saying, are you sure you don't want to come back? We would really like to have you back. <laughs> you know, if somebody believes they can make it and they've gotten themselves off of Social Security disability and they think they're doing okay, I understand if they've had the disability once, we may want to make it easier. And in fact, this friend of mine did that, got off once and it was a little early for his particular issue. And he went back on, and then he got himself off the second time. I understand we may want to make it a little easier for him to get back on if they've made the mistake of getting off, but I don't know that sending them advertising letters, and that's what it looked like to me. I saw a copy of it. An advertising letter saying, please get back on the public assistance is exactly what I think is the way government ought to operate. So that's one problem. We also need more aggressive. The If it were private disability insurance, now the rules are all different, and I understand that, so I want people thinking I don't understand the rules for private disability and social security disability are the same, but the private insurance companies are very aggressive about sending folks out to film to see if you're you know, claiming to be disabled but you're working on the side or you're playing basketball uh, for an hour every you know, Saturday morning at the rec center. And uh, depending on the disability, now some disabilities don't affect your basketball play, but depending on the disability, I think we need to do, do more of that kind of thing. I'm working on some proposals some constituents have made. Don't have anything definitive yet that I think works, but some some ways that maybe we can have folks who get upset about it have a way to contact Social Security and say, I don't want to tell I don't want to tell my I don't want to tell my neighbor that I think he's cheating, but would you look into it kind of deals. I'm not sure that you know that's it's it's a sticky wicket when you start doing that. But I'm looking at some proposals in that regard. I think there's some ways that we can change some of that, but I don't think that borrowing more money is, is the way to go. We've got to fix the problem. I would love to be one of the guilty of that. Maybe. All right. <laughs> She's got some people she thinks ought to be uh, yes. looked into. <laughs> so do I. And what's interesting is if you ask, if you ask 100 people, you probably find at least 20 who would say, yeah, I got somebody I'm not sure about. We don't always know their medical history. and and whether or not they may have something that's not readily visible. But at the same time, there ought to be a mechanism for alerting the Social Security system that there might be an issue there. You have a question in the back? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks, uh, Representative Griffin, for coming tonight. Uh, we have term limits for governors, presidents. Uh, why don't we have term limits for senators and, and U.S. representatives where they cannot go in and build the empire that Scott is
if, if weakens the ability of the rural areas to push their agenda. New York City is always going to have lots of representatives. Chicago, Los Angeles, the big cities are going to have plenty of representatives, so they will always have clout. The rural areas are getting, are getting fewer and fewer uh, representatives. The 9th District of Virginia grows 70,000 this decade, as you know, uh, which is why the line will bubble forward, you know, more east, more north. Uh, that's happening all across the country. All the rural districts are not keeping up with the urban districts. You cripple the, the rural district's ability to have any influence in Washington if you do term limits. Now, it may be coming, but that's, I'll have to, I gotta keep swinging this way. I'll get back to you. But uh, I know it's a very popular concept, and if I was just gonna tell you the political answer, it would be, oh yeah, I'm for that. But I see it as a real weakness long term in the Republic, particularly for the areas that are not in the urban centers. Yes, ma'am, we'll go back here. I got you earlier. Yes, yes, ma'am. And I'm trying to get as many folks in as I can. Well, it is my understanding that when Dick Cheney was vice president, he made it possible for these uh, companies that are fracking for oil and gas to be exempt from all environmental uh, standards. And I'd like to see that overturned. That There's some work being done on fracking. Uh, one of the things that most folks are, uh, I think, are in agreement with, although the baguette bill is not one that I favor and hold, I do think that everybody who's fracking ought to tell us what they're putting into their fracking solution. It's a closely held trade secret. A lot of companies don't want to tell us that, but we can't monitor whether or not what they're doing damages the water supply. We don't know what they're using. So I would like to see what they're using. I think that's the first step, uh, and then we have to take a look at it based on sound science uh, as to whether or not you can use fracking. But right now, it's a very effective way of getting gas out of, the, out of the ground. We've been doing a form of fracking for some time. Uh, not what they're doing as much with the sideways uh, uh, drilling, but we've been using you know, fracking of stone uh, for quite some time, particularly in the coal fields, to get natural gas out. Uh, but, but that's uh, something that we are looking at. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've been using um, a term um, to identify our nation lately, and the word keeps coming up to me is fascism. Why is it that these corporations, these huge corporations, continue to sell our nation from underneath us, our politicians and our large corporations, who seem to only be um, invested in making profits for themselves? It just feels to me that my father and my grandfather fought against fascism, and it feels like that's the nation that I live in now. What is your stance on that? How does that feel in Washington? Well, I don't, I don't believe that uh, we're headed towards fascism at this time. Uh, I think that's a little bit strong. Uh, term. Is it? Yes, ma'am. All right. That being said, I mean, if you look at the historical definition, I don't think we're on a fascism course. That being said, I would tell you that, yes, there are always going to be corporate bad guys who only care about putting profit in the CEO's pocket or in their pockets. That's always going to be a problem. But there also are a lot of CEOs who care a lot about their employees. Uh, I voted against this. As an example, I voted against the uh, Korean Free Trade Act. One of the reasons I voted against it was because uh, a manufacturer in the 9th District came to me and was talking about what it would do to his business. He had gone to another politician who was not a Virginian. This is a multi-state corporation. And somebody in their office had said, well, the textile industry is just, it, it, textiles are hurt by the Korean Act. Textiles are just going to be collateral damage. He looked me in the eye and he said, this is the CEO. He looked me in the eye and he said, I've had to tell 300 people before that they worked for me, for my family, for 30 years, and that we were going to have to close the plant. He said, I'm going to do everything I can to keep the plants open. He said, I don't see those employees as collateral damage. I see them as real, live people who make a difference in their community and whose income that they make, helping us make our product, helps those communities move forward. So you have folks like that. I was at a, at a coal, with a coal uh, executive of a pretty big coal company. Similarly expressed that, we had a meeting uh, where I got to talk, like I'm talking with you all on issues and answer questions. As the employees came in, he's calling them by name, asking them about their spouses. You know, not everybody who's a corporate CEO is just looking out for profit. 
Not a lot of them want to stay here in the United States, but they want an environment that makes it feasible for them to continue doing business. They don't have to get super rich, but they want to be able to be in a competitive environment where they can at least compete with the other nations of the world without having their hands tied behind their back and beating their head against the wall. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, in relation to that, the opposite point of view. Yes, sir. You believe in a free market, right? Yes, sir. Right. I, I think that's the opposite of what this lady's talking about. I mean, a, per a person has the uh, choice whether they want to uh, make a lot of money any way they want as long as it's legal. That's what our country's built on. Yeah, and in fact, that was exactly the reason, opposite. That's up to you. And that's exactly the opposite of what the National Socialist Workers' Party in Germany wanted. Yes. You know, they wanted I something fascism. different. That's fascism. Yeah. Free market is, is the antidote to fascism. I, how I was defining that was corporations coming into politics and merging the both. I see the politicians being swayed and funded by large corporations. That was my definition. Thank you all for being here. Let me say again, I know a lot of you can't say